last month with Amy Small when we talked about children and anxiety. If you have any ideas or recommendations, if there's anything that you'd like to hear about, please let us know. Uh, I'm Susie London. I'm the middle and high school psychologist. And this is uh, my dear colleague, Mrs. Rena Rybovsky, the elementary school psychologist. Okay, we're really glad that you're all here. Um, this is such an important topic. And so we're glad that so many of you have joined us. Um, I'm really looking forward to introducing all of you to Dr. Miriam Dunn. She is an expert in the field of social media and how it affects our children. So I'm really glad that she's here and that she's joined us and she's going to answer all of our questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Dunn. Hello, hello, hello everyone. So happy to see the amount of people that, I, that it's joining this conversation. I know we all have a lot of questions about, about it. I always say that we did not grow up with social media and it makes it so much difficult for us as parents. I feel one of the biggest challenges that we're having right now is are we raising children based on fear or on becoming or, or raising children be, because of their greatness. And I think that when we live in a, in a situation of the unknown, it is much more difficult to raise children based on greatness. And um, as, uh, as a result of a lot of things that I've seen in my private practice for 11 years already that I've been practicing in Aventura, I can tell you that seeing young adults and teenagers and even, even adults, I started seeing the complex effect that technology have, has in our lives, in our relationships, in our emotions, in the way we can concentrate. And I said to myself, you know what? We haven't done enough. You know, we haven't done enough. And it was the time that I had to give the, the smartphone to my oldest child. And I was so afraid of giving it to her. And I said, you know what? I need to do a lot of research about it, about this. I went like three years ago, started doing a lot of research and realized how little we know. And uh, now only, you know, after only three years, there's so much knowledge, so much research that are really validating the negative effect that technology and social media has in our lives. So finally, it is time to make a change. I, when I think about social media, I feel that it's very similar to the research on smoking, so smoking tobacco. At the beginning, it was all free. People could smoke anywhere. Didn't understand the real health consequences of, of smoking. But after a lot of research, we are like, oh my God, you know, we cannot have such a free um, um, mentality when it comes to, to tobacco. And now we're facing the same with social media. Now we really know that there are big consequences. There was this documentary called Social Dilemma which really opened up the eyes of a lot of people. And it is time, it is time that as a society, as a community, as parents, we have to start making a change, not only creating awareness, but also making real behavioral changes because we're dealing with what, 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 what it's called the hype machine. You know, a machine that is algorithm that are hijacking our brain in a way. And it's creating an automaticism that is hard for us to control. So we have to translate this awareness into real changes that are that are, have to do with boundaries, that have to do with, um, with connecting more with our family members and our loved ones. So as a result of all that research and all those questions that I had, I created a company called Digital Sake. Uh, Sake has a meaning, maybe I'll have time to talk about it or maybe not. And basically the way we help parents is with different type of products. We have like a daily tips, it's a membership where we provide parents with a daily practical, useful information where make them think, reflect whether they're doing it right or wrong with their children, if they can add more things to um, raise children, as I said, independent, healthy, and good human beings, because I think at the end that's our job, you know, those three. Then we help parents do all the parental control. I know it's not easy. Uh, some parents have no idea how to use technology. And the reality is that nowadays, every single device has the option of having parental control. How do I know if I, I'm doing parental control or not? Your child always has to have a child account. Whether you have Netflix, whether you have computer, a smartphone, tablet, consoles, a child account is the first step always to truly have real parental control of our children's uh, media. 
Then we have classes of coding. I always say that it's not really about uh, technology in general that's wrong. It's about how we use technology. It's the content of technology. So you can have active content and passive content. And I'm a big believer that if our children want to play video games, we should take that passion and translate it into coding. So we have this Roblox Studio platform, which is the platform that creates the video games of Roblox. And we teach children to use Roblox Studio so that they can create their own games. And then, you know, we have more of the clinical plan that integrates parental control and also helping parents deal with all the boundary issue, communication about technology that is so important that for some parents it's very difficult. Conversations that we need to have with our children, which are key, and we're gonna be talking more about it with those questions that you ask. And finally, if this is something of interest, if you share my view of technology, please feel free to go to a lot of you know, free information that we have. There's the, I do a lot of work on my IG channel to create a lot of awareness. There's a bunch of live, we have this podcast, but I, it's in Spanish and in English, you know, you can find the content according to the language that you speak. And in YouTube, I also provide a lot of videos and information that can be useful to you. So Rina, should we start with, uh, with these great questions that I already read? I love them. Let's start with the questions. Thank you so much for that introduction. Now that we know all about what you do, I think a lot of these questions that parents sent in and that we created are going to make a lot of sense because it really fits in with what you, what you do in all of your work. So first of all, help. Is it too late? At this point, if people haven't set up parental controls, how would you recommend that you go about doing that? How can you monitor social media for your kids while respecting their boundaries? What kind of filters do you recommend? And can you talk to us a little bit about responsibility, responsibilities versus privileges as it pertains to screen time? Okay, so is it too late? Well, never, it's never too late. Um, I think as a society, we have an issue with boundaries because it has a negative connotation. You see it all the, all the time in magazines, Instagrams, you know, you should put your boundary, like if it's a big no, okay? And I think we have to rephrase the concept of boundary and see it as, an, as a door for opportunities. You put boundaries because you want certain things to happen differently. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have with our children if you haven't put parental control and you want to put parental control. Children have to see that putting boundaries on technology has nothing to do with the fact that they're being, they're misbehaving or that you don't trust them. It has to do with a lifestyle, okay? It's like you wanna start being Shomre Shabbat, okay? Or you wanna start doing something good for yourself, for your life. So I think that's the way to put it out there. A lot of parents, we have had some parents put in the parental control where they are afraid that they're gonna lose the, the information because a child that has a cell phone without parental control is a child that has an open cell phone with an account of an adult. The good news is that we have the cloud and you can take that information of that account and put it into a child account. So that is doable, yes. Are you gonna have issues with your child? Yes. Is it gonna be hard to talk about it? Yes. Are they gonna complain? 100% yes. But I think you know, to start really talking about technology so that children understand the negative effect of technology, we have to talk about the brain. You know, if we see data on suicide, um, suicide is the number two reason of death of young people, meaning that we've done amazing work dealing with physical illnesses, but not with mental health. And it, this is a time I think there, you know, things happen for a reason in a way. So we are dealing with this technology issue and this is forcing us to start talking about the brain to our children, to get informed and explain to our children how the brain is being affected by technology. There's a lot of information in YouTube, a lot, beautiful videos can actually show reality to the, to the children, not messages that are you know, very extreme, but really show the positive aspect, aspect of technology as well as the negative aspect of technology. So this, is a, a, this will be a process where you will be informing your children about the brain the negative effect, you know, I always say, if somebody um, has an issue with the arm, you know, have, uh, have, have a wound, something in the, in the arm, okay, and you see them that they have a cast or something, you're not going to ask that person to grab something with two hands because they can't, but you don't see the, the, the pain on the, on the brain, you don't see the wounds on the brain, and it's really hard to explain to a child that actually technology has an impact to the, to the brain. So it is a process, you know, it's a, it's a lifestyle, it's a communication. 
And I think at the end has to do all, it's all about moderation. I think it's all about how we integrate technology in the life of our children more than actually li limiting technology in the life of our children. Um, do I, am I missing? Okay, privilege. You know, one of the things that I always say when you're, especially when you're giving a smartphone to a child, I think um, that involves a conversation where the child needs to understand that the smartphone is not theirs, it's yours. You're allowing them to use the, the smartphone. And that has to do with that privilege versus responsibility type of aspect. And um, so, so when, if you are about to give the smartphone to your child, I honestly recommend that you tell them, you know what, I'm giving you something that belongs to a person that is independent. Uh, I'm not giving you something that, you know, a child really can use. And that's a reality. We're accelerating a process of freedom with our children right now, because that's what smartphones are. It be, it's free freedom, freedom to, to friends, to the world, to information, to entertainment. Uh, and the reality is that we work hard to get freedom in the old days. You know, you work hard so that you can go on vacation, so that you can eat in a good restaurant. And then we have to build independence in, that's my conception, building independence has to go along with their privilege of using technology. What filters do you recommend? All, pretty much every single device have their own filters. And those are the, the ones that I recommend the most. The problem is that when children turn 14, Apple and Google have decided that they're adults. So you cannot control their content in the cell phones anymore you can only control what they download in the cell phones. So we have an application called FamiSafe, F-A-M-I. I can, I can type it later in the, I will type it later in the, in the, and it's the one that we set up for parents. The reason why I'm starting to use that application because I am a strong believer that if there's one type of content that no minor should see at all is pornography. And that needs to be limited 100%, no matter the age of the child. And there are parental controls that allow uh, parents to do that type of, of control in, this, in the smartphones. I know there's still, there's probably some that they're gonna still watch, but we have to limit the novelty, the endless type of information out there. And, and I think it's our responsibility as parents to do so. So I recommend that specific app. I'll put it out there. We provide that service too to install it because one of the, we, we do statistics and 40% of parents actually don't put parental control because it's, they don't know how to start. That's one of the reasons or it's, um, you know, they're, I mean, it's too much work. That's another reason actually why they mentioned this, but um, we honestly, and we'll go, into why it is so important to start making sure that we use technology to help us become better parents and put boundaries in the digital world. Okay, so that I think kind of speaks to what you were talking about. I know you mentioned some of these things about your model of parenting that you talk about. Um, so did you cover all the things that you wanted to on this? You know, what, 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 what the research shows is that in this world of technology, parents have to be mentors. Research shows that being only limiters, actually it's related to problemat online problematic behaviors of children, whereas parents that are more mentors tend to have children that get less in, tr in, less in problems you know, in the digital world. So pretty much my model of parenting has to do with these four pillars. One is parental control. Another one is knowledge about applications. You know, each application, I see it as a country, as a world, okay? Where it has its own culture, its own dynamics, its own way of communicating. What it means to be ugly in TikTok is not the same as being ugly in Snapchat, as being ugly in, in Instagram. It has complete different connotations for them. And I don't even get it. And they even play with things that are hard for me to believe that they play with serious things related to mental health, depression, suicide, and things like that. And, and the sarcasm that they use, it, I am amazed by how the communication changes according to the platform. So it is so important to get to know the platforms well as parents. That's why we have these daily tips. It's part of the things that we involve in our daily tips. Um, and... Um, you know, it's like when you, when we were young and we used to go to a club, you know, if your child's gonna go to a club, you know what's gonna happen in a club because we were in a club. We don't know 
what, how does it feel to be a teenager and be in social media in the specifics uh, apps, which is completely different and we'll talk more about it. And the third one for me is super important, conversations. I think we come from a generation of parents that the way they raise us is by telling us a lot of what no to do, no to do and showing what to do. They, they will lead with example. We live in a world that leading with example is extremely important, but we need to talk a lot because children are seeing too much. So we have to show them the way. They have too many options right now. So we have to show them the way. So it's not only talking about the no, it's also talking about the how, the yes, okay, the what's better for them. And that involves talking about many single issues, uh, you know, about every single aspect. And, you know, that's one of the things that we also help parents, you know, be aware of. You know, my child is nine years old. What type of conversation do I need to have with my child if my child is playing Roblox, for example? You know, what could happen in that world that it's important for me to start talking to them about it? And then emotional connection, you know, especially the pandemic. I have to tell you, for me, the pandemic was an eye opener, a huge eye opener where people, everyone is spending so much time in front of a screen. And imagine all that time that we will not be on a screen, we will be with other people talking, interchanging ideas, you know, maybe getting hugs, kisses, you know, a feeling of truly being, feeling loved. And if we want to raise children with transparency in, this, transparency in this world, we need trust. And we develop trust with good emotional connections. So it's so important that we have that, especially nowadays. So those are like my four pillars of being mentors in, a, in, in the world of technology. Thank you, Dr. Dum. So for our next, next question, I know that this is something that I struggle with personally with my own children. And I'm always so taken aback when I meet with students in the middle and high school. And I'll say to them, okay, let me see your phone. Let's check your settings. Um, and let's check like daily screen time use. And I'll see like upwards of eight to 10, 12 hours. And um, it's shocking to me. So what would you recommend? What do you think is the right amount of time for children, tweens and teens to spend on their devices? No, that is an extremely hard question to answer. I'm gonna give you the means that we have before pandemic, okay? I have, I'm checking every day. What are the means of, of now? And I, I haven't found research yet. It's not, it's not out yet, but you can calculate that it's probably like 20, 30 or even 40% more than it was before. So twins are the average use, daily use is six hours. Teens is eight hours. That's the average daily use. I'll be honest with you. I feel we sometimes put too much pressure on time and we need to, to put more pressure into what is a child not doing in the real world because of the cell use. You know, I think that's the number one question. So you need to ask yourself, you know, what, according to your values, according to your conceptions of racing, is my child doing what they have to do in a weekly basis? Okay, what they need to become in my mind is independent, healthy and, uh, and kind individuals. Okay, and maybe for some of you here, like spiritual individuals. Okay, is that really happening? Is technology affecting that? According to the Canadian, the Canadian uh, Pediatric Association, they're saying that a twin, a teen, it should be no more than two hours a day. Okay, that's the statistics that they bring. A, a six-year-old, probably no more than 45 minutes a day. No, and I, I see those numbers and I think that they're, they're, they're tough, you know? So the way I do it is differently. You know, I, especially in our communities that are so socials. So I allow WhatsApp and FaceTime, I don't put it that much as screen time, okay? Everything that is interaction, especially FaceTime, okay? So, and now, especially now. And then what I do with tweens and teens, which I think it's my suggestions, is I try to create clusters of, of, of limits where you put something that they love, that you feel is healthy, and then you put in the same cluster what you don't want them to do as much. So they have to learn how to regulate their time, okay, with all the applications that they want to use. So for example, my daughter, okay, she loves Snapchat. That's the way she communicates with her children. I think she uses well. I don't think she has a good use with TikTok, for example. You know, I hate how she uses TikTok particularly because it's a very passive thing. But then when it is in the time limit with Snapchat, 
she doesn't use TikTok as much because then the time, you know, she wants to use time spending more with her friends than with TikTok. So that's the way I encourage you to start playing around with screen time in a way that will benefit your children and reduce the passive learning experience on the device. Thank you. Thank you. So I kind of flashed this before, but you know, we know that kids are just so addicted um, to their phones, to their devices. So one of our questions for you in general is how can we help our kids be more responsible with their social media accounts? and I guess use it in a positive way. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how young is too young um, and the difference between real and fake accounts? And this is a pretty important question that we heard from several parents. What should I do if I don't allow a certain app like TikTok, for example, but my child's friends are all allowed to use it? How, how would you manage that? So I know those are really big questions, but. I know, I know, but you have more questions there in Social Dilemma, no? Oh, no we have other ones, okay. Yes, so a little later. Yeah. The first question, how can we help, help our kids to use social media in a positive way? I'm gonna leave it to, to a different place, okay? I'm gonna go very more into details and specifics in here. Uh, what is the appropriate age to social media? So after seeing Social Dilemma, which I go back, I think it's actually 21, you know, and I'll explain later why. But since uh, that will be too ideal right now, uh, which who knows, maybe in the future, the effects are so detrimental that that's what's gonna happen in the future. But for now, um, one of the things that I feel it's extremely important is that for a child, so first of all, age, 100%, no less than 12. I don't, I don't think that a child less than 12 years old should be in TikTok, Instagram, or Snapchat. That's my perception. Okay, now why do I say this? I, I, and I, I had an interview with a beautiful young woman, 16 year old uh, girl that lives in Panama who uses social media like crazy, but she's a very st has strong character. She uses according to her passions, she has hobbies. And the conversation with her was very, very interesting because she did mention that it doesn't matter how strong you are or how, how, how strong your, uh, your self-esteem is, you will always feel insecure in social media. And I ask her, so, you know, you're 16 right now. Tell me about your sister who is 10. What do you think about her entering social media? And she said, it's going to be very different than me because I feel that a 10-year-old that starts using social media, a 10-year-old has not developed a passion well, has not developed a, a strength, like a feeling of this is something that I do strong. Therefore, the implications of posting for their levels of insecurity are going to be higher. And she said that, and I thought that that's the because I couldn't say it so well. Like she said it amazingly well. So the thing is that for a child to be able to be in social media, they have to love a lot something about themselves so that they don't get caught up in the popularity in the likes, in the sensation that we all get in social media of always feeling rejected when you use it. Because you post something and you have 300 followers and only 10 people put, 100 people, which is amazing, 100 likes for them, it's always amazing, but it's still there were 200 people that didn't like a post. And you wonder why they didn't like a post, okay? And then you see somebody with a filter and then you wonder why you, you don't look like the person in the, in the filter. I mean, there's, you have to understand something, all of us. These platforms are made for us to feel in a negative way so that we keep using them. That's the purpose. And whenever I see kids playing video games and being very competitive and wanting to, to, to win, I said, you will always feel that you're losing when you play video games. Why? Because it's made for that. It's like going to the casino. It is made for you to think that you are going to win, therefore that you're going to feel popular, that you're going to feel accepted, or that you're going to win a video game. But at the end, you don't get there. Never. <laughs> no. And explaining the why these platforms are made to our children is so important to help them deal with those negative effects that, that social media and video games are having in their persona, in their mental health. Uh, the difference between a real and a fake account, yes, it has to do with strangers. You know, one of the things for me, it's key. There's two things that are key here. One is that, um, that we have to explain to our children 
how does a child communicate and how does an adult communicate? A child, when you're playing with a child, the child is never concerned about you. They're concerned about the game. You know, do you like the game? You don't like the game. The child is not gonna ask you about how you're doing, how was your day? Tell me about your family, where? Tell me about, give me the address of your home. You know, the, so if the, the child has to know anytime they're in a platform that there's possible contact with strangers, they have to understand that if, a ch if they're, received, they're being treated differently with those questions, that for sure it's an adult. You know, we have to teach them that. A child will never care too much. The other day I had a mom telling me, no, and she just said it like randomly. She wasn't even paying attention to what she was saying. And she's like, no, my son, he's playing Fortnite and suddenly, and, and there's this other kid talking about a, 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 like a, a religion, like evangelical. I don't know how it's the name in, in, in English, you know, like trying to convert the boy in that religion. And I said to the mom, you know that that's probably not a boy playing with your child. That's probably an adult. A boy would never do something like that. And the mom stopped and she looked at me and she's like, oh my God, of course. Like I didn't even think about it. So we have a lot of adults playing as children. We have sexual predators. We have uh, people that are trying to convert kids into certain things. And it is so important that we have that conversation for them with them. Now, usually what I get with children is that they listen to us and they go like, ah, that will never happen to me like that, no? So you have to take a vul, you have to give them an example, a scene where they can feel vulnerable. So for example, if your child wants a tablet too much and you go like, what if you're playing with a friend and he's super nice and funny and you're getting along and you don't know that person and that person tells you, ah, you know what? My father works in a store and they have this promotion of, of tablet. If you give me your email, I can put you in the list. Maybe you can win one. And then see the reaction of your child. So you have to give them a real example so that they can see how every single human being is vul vulnerable to these predators, that they know how to be charismatic and they know how to conquer the attention and the emotional well-being of our children. So that's something that I wanted to leave there. Uh, what should I do if I don't allow, you know what, one of the things that we're suffering this, we're suffering with FOMO, fear of missing out. So when your child tells you that, we feel FOMO, like, oh my God, my child is not going to be included. And then they're going to have all these dances and, and they're not going to invite her to, to a play date. Yes, it, there are choices that we have to make, you know. Um, I don't know, is it really, is it okay if I talk about manual monitoring of social media here? Or no? Yeah, yes. yeah sure. absolutely. Okay, so imagine that you do have a child that is 10 years old, even 12, okay? And they're in TikTok. And, uh, and, and the question is, how do I monitor TikTok? Um, one of the things that I always recommend, TikTok actually have one of the best parental controls inside the application. Just that, you know, if you go to settings, well-being, you can see that you can, be, you can become the parent of that child and you can check what they're doing. You know, for me, TikTok, uh, be, there's three things about TikTok. There's the passivity of learning. You know, we, we say that there's like, if you, if you measure the attention span, you know, how, the, how it's been altered by the type of media that they see is very interesting. We have gener the millennials, they used to see a program in Nickelodeon 20 minutes. Okay, Gener Generation C, 10 minutes, average time it will be uh, in youtube tiktok is one minute each program like each it's actually one one minute we call that generation t tiktok okay and in one minute there's so much going on in that minute like i cannot believe how much it's going on in one minute so they see 50 videos of one minute each instead. And when in YouTube, you cannot see 50 videos in one, in one minute. So imagine the, um, the amount of information that they're processing, okay, in 50 minutes, a lot of information. So what, that's one of the issues that I have. The second issue that I have is obviously the contact with strangers. You can put a private public, but there's contact with strangers. And that's another thing that we have to check a lot. Okay, and the other one is that I feel that as parents, as parents, we need to stop seeing technology as the enemy and we have to see it as a window to the inner world of our children. So when you see the for you page of your child, you get to know your child, you know their interests, 
You know what the world is communicating to them. You can help them differentiate of what's real, what's not, what's not good for them, what's not according to values. So it, it is more about that. So I encourage all parents that they do the manual monitoring, as I say, because it would really help you tie up the relationship with them, understand what they're doing, have more conversations about life with them, and also, you know, help them be, be more secure in the online world. Okay, so this cartoon accurately represents how to many of our students, having Wi-Fi or a good internet connection can feel as essential to their survival as water. And as educators, this is something we're grappling with on a daily basis. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eliezer Jones, our esteemed high school principal, who will be asking questions from an administrator's perspective. Dr. Jones? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you. This has been already uh, extremely important. So I really appreciate um, the presentation. You know, I actually, I'm new. This is my first year here. And uh, we have an amazing group of, of high schoolers uh, who are very attached to their phones. And more recently, I actually reminded our children um, about the cell phone policies in the school. And um, I've had a lot of conversations with them since. Uh, and even as of today, I was talking to a group and I said, you know, what if we didn't have it for lunch? And what if we were to talk with each other? You know, do you think that that would be something you'd be interested in? And one student actually said, it's like, listen, that sounds like a great idea, but I am addicted to my phone. So no, not for me. And I guess the big question is, you know, how do we create that culture where there's responsible use of phones, they're not dependent in, in an unhealthy way. Um, and you know, what policies have you seen work? Uh, my opinion is whatever we do, we really have to do with the students as a part of the process. Um, but right now we're struggling. Okay, a am I ready to talk? Yeah, or okay. Please. Um, I love this question. You know, I don't know if people are gonna like my answers, but I love it. Okay. I don't I don't know if people that are listening to me. I hate it by that I cannot see the faces of people in this conversation, you know, and I'm here looking uh, at not not everyone. But I wonder, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people out there have sent their kids to summer camp. Okay? What are the faces when they come back? How do they feel without technology? How happy they are after they come back from summer camp. Aren't they super happy? Even us when they, we detach from our cell phone, you know, for 24 hours or 48 hours, it just feels amazing. So if you ask me, I think phones should not be allowed in school. Like I don't even understand how schools and why they allow cell phones. Like it makes no sense. Yesterday, now I, last night, okay? I was like asking, telling myself, like, why do I have to run around in my house with my cell phone all the time in my house from six o'clock or five o'clock to 9 p.m. or more? Like, it makes no sense. I need to start, leave the phone in my bedroom. I used to, we used to live life without phones and nothing happened. Nothing happened. This sense of urgency that we're creating in the kids by allowing them to have phones in the schools, it's awful. Let me go into the why I even think that during the lunch time they should not have it. Picture the following. A child has social anxiety, okay? Has difficulties relating towards other people and they can use their phone. Why would I even try to make friends? So the phone creates an environment of easy. The easy way out is the phone. In many cases, and we're allowing our children to follow that path. The school, it's a great place where they truly do not need the phone and they can interact. And the gift, the schools that they're gonna start implementing the policy, you're gonna see a change in your, in your students. The gift that you're gonna give your students understanding, because for a child to understand that technology has a negative impact in their emotions, the only way is to not have technology and see how it feels. It's the only way. But if they have technology all the time, they would not know that actually it is beautiful to live life without technology. So I highly recommend that you guys, if you are the first Jewish school in 
here in in Miami and Broward that implements that, oh my God. I mean, you can have me forever, for whatever, for whatever, for fully free services, I'll give you to you. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a follow-up because um, first of all, amen um, to everything you just said. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of parents agreeing, um, but this is really to the parents though. I, you know, when I sent out the policy, I don't know how many high school parents are on here. Um, you know, I got a lot of feedback like, thank you, yes. You know, and, and I was a little shocked. I was like, wait, I didn't invent this policy that we currently have, this was the policy. But clearly look, educators are struggling, parents are struggling, you know, and it's, we're all in this together. Um, the, in regard to the parents, um, you know, if we were to say tomorrow, which we're not doing tomorrow, but if say like, you know, we're gonna go cell phone free, um, our students would have a really hard time. They'd be going home to the parents. Um, the parents struggle with it as well. Um, how do we how do we get that partnership with you parents um, with the school to say you know we're going to do this, um, and have you I guess any advice around that um, or all the parents that are listening you're like don't worry about it we got your back. <laughs> you know, uh, Dr. Jones, when uh, when it was time to say no more smoking indoors, okay. We still have that in in our. No, I'm just kidding. We don't a lot. No, but uh, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, it was a very tough decision because people understood that smoking and eating was a, a pleasure. Like it was delicious for people that smoke. I don't smoke. Okay. So yes, it is great to have your phone during, the, during lunch. It feels amazing, but sometimes things that feel amazing might not be the best for you, you know? And I think the number one behavior that we need to start implementing as individuals with technology is boundaries, 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 boundaries. We cannot live a life without boundaries. You know, it just creates more dissatisfaction because you're not happy here or there. Like I feel technology, what it's doing, it's making us, making us focusing on what we don't have instead of us focusing more on what we actually have in the real world. And, and again, you know, I think maybe the school can start experimenting you know, maybe you can run an experiment. Let's do, uh, you know, January to April. Let's try it. We're not doing that. It's, this is something definitely. And let's see what happens. Maybe grades go up. Maybe kids that are that are having difficulties socially, they end up doing better. You know, maybe you start seeing, and maybe you can actually measure it, you know, and you start seeing with real indicators all the positive things that can come out out of not having cell phones in school. So that will be my suggestion. And then you give me that information and, and I'll implement that. it in my school. <laughs> and I appreciate all the, the comments in the chat as well. Yes, thank you. thank you. You're getting a lot of comments in the chat about this. So thank you for that. That was really powerful. Um, I guess kind of on the same note, what can we do as parents and as educators to have conversations with our kids to navigate the talk to them about the negative effect of social media? So why is social media so addictive? Um, how does it affect mental health? How should we deal with the cyberbullying that goes on? And then lastly, I know you mentioned this before, uh, with regards to the movie, The Social Dilemma, do you recommend that we have kids watch it? Yeah, 100%. I think that a mature 10 year old can watch the, the, the Social Dilemma documentary for sure. So, so I'm gonna get a little bit technical here and explain you know, why is this so addictive? So there's a part of our brain called social, the social brain, okay? That it's pretty much rooted in our fear of loneliness. And what's happening is that social media is designed to hijack that part of our brain. Meaning that we are constantly thinking and putting energy in the concept of we might be alone. That has a tremendous value for survival and being able to adapt in society. I mean, we have, I don't know if you've read Harari, uh, one of my favorite books that he has is Homo sapien. And he says that we as a species differentiate ourselves from other species is because of our capacity of building into other people's doing, okay? So the social aspect of ourself is extremely strong. And research is really starting to happen in right now in terms of that part of our brain that is extremely automatic, instinctive, okay? Animal in a way, okay? But different from other animals. 
and we have very small control over that. So we have a bunch of scientists doing research right now, for example, at, uh, at Facebook, there are 30 scientists doing research, trying to get to know what you want to buy because you know it yourself. We have these reels in social media, in Instagram. They're not for us to have fun. They're actually, they're doing that because they can read more into the person's emotional part so that they know more about that person and they can sell something in a better and faster and more automatic way. So we have to help our children understand why these platforms exist. They don't exist for us. Yeah, they do. They, 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 they try, they, they, maybe at the beginning, they thought they were doing this amazing thing of connecting the world, okay? But it turned to be an amazing business that they're doing business with our attention and our time. You know, we are all thinking the money, it's what values. But no, Mr. Zuckerberg, he's smarter than us. He said, no, no, no. The value is not in money. The value is in your attention and your time. I'm stealing your attention and your time. So we just start talking because the difference between us and maybe the children that live in Silicon Valley is that we are consumers. We're not the creators of technology. And to help our children understand the negative effect of technology, they, start to, they need to start thinking as those creators. They need to understand the part, the manipulative aspect of technology so that they, they don't buy into their games. What is a game? For me, it's very simple. So you feel inadequate. You feel insecure. You might feel that people are not into you. So you go into the platform and you post something and you post something and then you get a reaction. So those notifications, what are creating is social dopamine in our brain. We feel better about myself and maybe I'm important. You know, you think about the likes, you know, why is the like such an important indicator? Because it's better for them, not for us. I think we should have other indicators in social media, like credibility or maybe likes based on something. I like it because it's beautiful. Okay, good. I like it because it's helpful, you know, but the like so general is leading to the concept of popularity that is so endless because you will always find somebody that is more popular to, than you. And sadly, it's creating in our youth a lot of insecurity. So the social media really affect mental health? Yes. And there's a lot of research about it. You know, suicide attempt has increased since 2009. Suicide has increased since 2009 and depression and anxiety. There's a new research that came out from the UK, which they do an amazing job doing research on, on social media. And, um, and they, they found that children that are engaged in a lot of extracurricular activities, those children have less chances of getting involved in social media. Being too, too much time in social media is related with depression and anxiety, the time, and being in too many platforms, it's also related with more anxiety and depression and body image issues. I wanna give you one more statistic for you to understand something that is extreme. When I saw this, I'm like, oh my God, social media not only affects girls, it also affects boys. And we need to understand that. There was a research conducted also in the UK and they, and for of, of men that are active in social media, 17% experience suicide ideation as a result of not feeling that they're good enough or have a good look when it comes to comparing themselves to other people in social media. So this is affecting everyone. Now, cyberbullying, dealing with cyberbullying. This is a very complex issue that I can be talking about it the whole night, but pretty much to summarize it in one minute, I think it is important that children understand that um, we live in a world with different type of people. So as soon as they get involved in social media, we have to under they have to understand that they're sick people, they're people that are, that are mean, they're people that they don't have the same values that they do. And if they, that there is somebody out there that hurts them emotionally or they're insulting them, the best thing that we can do to reduce the chances of this becoming a problem emotionally for them is to tell them that they're not the problem. The problem is the other person. You know, that's number one. I'm sure most of us tend to do that. But the second thing that it will be amazing is when a child has been cyberbullied, 
it is very powerful that somebody reach out to them and tell them, you know what? What happened to you was unfair. You know, the support, feeling the support of their friends. You know, don't even worry about that. You know, don't pay attention to it. That person has issues. Whenever a child experiences that support, I'm telling you that it's something super important. And those values, we need to uh, talk about them with our children. It's the support of seeing these terrible things happening in the in the digital world. But I have I have so much to say. I'm sorry, but I cannot focus on everything that I have to say about about cyberbullying right now. That's a whole nother topic. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So should we go to a, on a, the, uh, how to talk about addiction again? Honestly, if you have a hard time really talking about it, besides of my tips that are good. No, I'm kidding. Go to YouTube. YouTube is a great place where you can find great videos that you can watch together. And it's very powerful because they do it well. They do it, they do it for you, you know, and then you can have a discussion about that. How do you know if a video is good or not? The video has to have the pros and cons of social media. If you have a video that only talks about the cons, your child is not going to listen to you. Okay, and, and, and research on prevention of drugs and alcohol use says that when you have somebody presenting on alcohol or drug abuse and you only present the, the bad part and you don't present the good part, children stop talking to you. They don't listen to you. So we have to be honest whenever we give presentations to them and talk about the positive and the negative. Okay, so this cartoon happens to be the perfect introduction for our next topic. There's an app for that. So, see our question. Okay, so what is the difference between TikTok and Instagram for kids? And maybe can you tell us what video games and social media you would recommend or you believe are safe or the non-passive ones? And what video games and social media are definite no-nos? Okay. Um, okay, the no-nos of social media. Any social media that have not the capacity of having a private account, should be a no-no for a child that is less than 17 according to the the you know the app store and you know google play so and that those are and you see it you know the reason why they're 17 plus it's because you don't have the chance of making it private okay and i agree there's more predator predators there and um you know and i i would not recommend it you know like tumblr kick Rabbit, you know, those are examples of applications like those. Um, so video games and social media that are safe, again, sorry, nothing is 100% safe. That doesn't exist. And they're gonna, nothing is safe in life. At the end, what is safe? Nothing is safe. So this is a process where we have to be learning with our kids where a lot of problems are gonna happen. So having an open communication with them is the most important. Doing the manual monitoring is super important. In terms of video games, what are the video games that I don't like? There are video games that are extremely violent, okay? And they have very scary looks. Like for example, you have Piggy in Roblox. You know, you have Granny in Roblox too that are awful. The crown killer in Roblox. Actually Roblox, just that you know, has parental control. So it reduces the exposure to video games that are not good for younger children, just that you know, inside Roblox, you can put parental control. Then you have other like, like Warcraft, Silent Hill, The Evil Within. The, one of the re research is showing that actually video games increases sexism, increases a culture of rape. Um, you have to understand that when the child is playing these games, it's even more powerful than when a child is watching a video because children are not playing Mario Bros anymore. They're playing their own avatar. So they might be in a game where there's, there's illegal activities going on, selling and buying drugs, you know, they're killing people themselves, or you know, they, they're stealing things from friends in the actual moment. You are actually insulting people when you're playing with somebody. So it's you, it's a child that is having those interactions. So it is important to check the content of the game. If you see the research, actually, is interesting. Besides of the sexism, you know, and uh, and the the 
you know, issues that, that we see here where men is much stronger and woman is much weaker, that type of information and the sexualization of women. There's a lot of games where there's a lot of prostitution going on within the game as part of the pretend game. And besides of that, the number one reason of mental health problems because of gaming has to do with competition more than violence. So it's a, if, the, if the child has an example of what it means to be empathic, you know, of empathy at home and they practice empathy at home, violence should not be a problem, honestly. It should not have a negative effect in the mind of that child. But competition, it is fully related to depression and anxiety in children that play video games. TikTok and Instagram, what is the difference? The completely two different platforms. Completely. Instagram is trying to include real, well, for me, Instagram is trying to create a WeChat, you know. I think what, what they're trying to do is create this massive, huge platform where you can do every, anything. Play video games, have TikTok inside everything. But TikTok, it's, it's amazing, <laughs> honestly. It's one of the most amazing platforms. I think it's gonna be there for a really long time. It, it, it really grasps the essence of Generation C which is their generation C is the new generation that grew, grew with social with uh, social media and t and Instagram actually is not that they don't like it as much so Instagram it's about pretty much posting the highlights and inst and TikTok it, I think TikTok and if you think I one one time I say this and I'm like I'm going to say I'm not sure but then when I realized who was the CEO of the company which was a former uh, um, employee in Disney World I think TikTok, it's like your stage. You can do anything in TikTok. And it has an am amazing also effects. So it's very appealing for children. Uh, you can do your own movie uh, and it, it stimulates for me. One of the things that I love about TikTok is that it, it stimulates again, the non-verbals. You know, before Instagram, just po everybody posting for a picture and, yeah, and that's it, no? Uh, here it gives you, you know, children have to go back into the, their emotions, you know, they have to be more creative, um, they have to more, be more into the risk zone when it comes to posting, be more authentic, it's more about having skills and not so much about your looks and whether you live in this amazing place or you go to an amazing vacation, so what it is value in both platforms, it is completely different. Okay, thank you. All right, so our last topic is boredom. So I think that's something that hasn't really changed. Kids have always kind of complained about being bored, even with all this technology that they have access to. So how should we handle it when our kids complain to us that they're bored, especially if we don't have technology? Um, I, I think we, we need, you know, okay, let, let's go into the brain and understand what, what's boredom, okay? Emotions are there for a reason. We have this thing in our society that we separate good emotions and bad emotions, and that's, that's, that's a problem. You know, all emotions are good. They're there for our survival. They're there because they're communicating us something, okay? Boredom is there as a mean for the person to do something, okay? Because they're not in an, un they're, they're uncomfortable. You know, they're not getting anything from life. So what's happening is that children are resolving boredom too much from external factors, from external stimuli, and not from internal. They're relying on things that are out there and not on themselves. So they don't know how to deal with boredom. So I think boredom is one of the most, children that learn how to deal with boredom alone without relying on technology, on, on parents. Like I make that mistake a lot as a mom. You know, I can be the clown. I tell to my children, you know, like I'm not a clown, but I behave like a clown in my home. So they, anytime they're bored, they come to me because I love to play. And it's an issue, you know, I, I'm creating a type of dependency still there. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the children, it's, it's also for me, the, the issue of them getting bored, it will help them to, to grab more responsibility of their life, to, and, you know, make sure that if they get to resolve it, it's like, it is my responsibility to be happy. It is my responsibility to do something about my life. It is my responsibility to be at a good stage, to get the best from life, 
So it is so important that we put them on that situation. I think if they get bored, we say, okay, do something about it. That's not my responsibility. That is your responsibility. And it is a good way to practice, you know, the activity of being responsible for our own emotions. I think one of the biggest uh, issues that we have in our society is that we put our emotions on other people. That we get upset and we feel that other people have to rescue us from our feelings of, of, of rage, frustration, irritability. So if we're not doing well, the whole family has to suffer because the person is not doing well. You see what I'm saying? So then if they're bored, that means that mom has to do something about it. So that we're giving them the wrong example for them in life, for them to have better relationship and connection with other human beings even to be a good employee at the end. You know, a better employee, it's an employee that takes responsibility of their actions, of their doings, that it's more proactive. So I 100% believe that if we allow our children to be bored, we're creating human beings that are more proactive and more responsible in the future. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dum. I think that was so um, thought provoking and we all have so much to think about now and talk about and follow up about. So everybody, this is Dr. Dunn's contact information if you would like to reach out or ask any questions or speak to her more. Thank you, thank you. That was really, really unbelievable. Um, we're going to have a raffle now. So Dr. Dunn, do you have any, I guess, final thoughts before we have our book raffle? Um, well, I think uh, that, um you know, um, as much as I, I gave these lectures, you know, and, I, and it feels that I am, um, that I hate technology, you know, that I hate social media. I don't hate social media uh, at all. I feel that we just have to learn, you know, and, and I make this similarity between social media and smoking, where smoking is just wrong. We should not be smoking because it really, it's terrible for our lungs. But, but you know, I think that, um, that uh, we are dealing in a little bit of crisis because there's not really somebody taking care and taking responsibility of the negative effect of technology. So we parents, uh, since government is not 100% doing their jobs, companies, they're not doing their jobs as, as well, tech companies. So we have a lot of weight on us and managing that boundary between this is wrong for you, but at the same time, this is something that you need to interact with other people, to live your life. You know, that boundary, it's important that you don't wanna to be too far in the I hate technology because then you're not gonna be able to communicate well with your children and you don't wanna be in the other side either. So try to find that balance, you know, it's extremely important because, and always, always mention something positive about it because if we keep just saying the negative, they're, they're not gonna be open to us. Make sure you, uh, all, you talk about the positive and the ne negative every time you have a conversation with your child. Thank you. Um, I know a lot of people are asking about the recording. It is being recorded, this conversation, and um, it'll go up on Dr. Lundzen and my website after probably tomorrow or the next day. So we'll share a link with, with all of you, if you'd like, for the website. It'll have all this information. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lundzen for our raffle. Always have to end the night with the raffle. Here we go. There was a lot there of names to put in tonight, everybody. Here we go. <laughs> Seth, you're the winner. So, Seth, if you're there, we'll send you. Thank you, thank you. I wish it. That's okay. right. We'll get, we'll get you your book. All right, congratulations. And um, Dr. Dunn, we can't thank you enough. You, Dr. Dunn, by the way, just so you know, everybody always volunteers her time to us and does this you know, gratis. And we really, really appreciate this because this was just amazing. So we're just so grateful to you. Thank you so much. So thank you for the invite and the trust. And I love your school and keep doing this, that amazing job that you're doing. And I really hope, you know, this conti you continue to progress and add this Jewish education plus great academics to our children and our community. So I'm so proud of all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for joining us, everyone. It was yeah. nice to see so many of your faces. No, it's nice to see all the faces now. <laughs>